Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. Similar to last week we're going to be adding a video but we're going to be adding it to a new section so you can see this is the about section we just got some text and pictures but you can go through and just add a section and in this case we're just going to add this video so this is basically like adding a gallery that you've seen before except as you can see I can now go to replace this stock video and then I can upload from file and it takes a few minutes for it to be uploaded but once it has uploaded then well there's the video um, obviously having just uploaded there's a little bit of low res going on but that will resolve itself uh, resolve itself over a short period of time and as you can see it's happily playing away there um, showing some of the training activities that we do so that's saved and you can see there some of the members of paladins of chivalry warming up before the public arrive so that's all fun and then going back up to the who we are I'm just going to add in a couple of extra sentences because I'm going to turn this area down below the who we are into a series of videos and photos showing what we are and what we do. So at the moment, just an extra line. Again, easy text edit saying please see below for some of our capabilities. And our edit for this week is done. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes but you never know you might want to do it for some other reason then head over to squarespace.com forward slash drakenafel you can get a free trial and once you're ready that little link will give you 10 percent off your first website or domain so thanks once again to squarespace for sponsoring the video and on with the main show hi i'm mrs drak i was born and grew up in south africa during part of my early life i lived in cape town and we'd find ourselves in simon's town and heading to it fairly frequently Prominently near the seafront was a statue of a huge dog, a Great Dane, and as a kid, and someone who already of course loved dogs, we often climbed the statues and played nearby. This statue commemorated a dog by the name of Just Nuisance, and his story is fairly well known in the Cape area and on the peninsula. Now we'd like to tell you a bit more about the good dogger. According to official records, on April 1st, 1937, the Great Danes, Diana and Koning, I'll leave you to work out which one was which, were blessed with a litter of puppies, one of whom would be registered with a kennel name of the Pride of Rodenbosch, or Rondebosch, apparently, named for the suburb of Cape Town, which he was born in. He had at least one brother who would later become known as Bats, and who we'll meet later on in this story. As with most giant breeds of dog, the puppy grew quickly, and within the year he was by far the largest dog of the litter. His siblings were all on track to be normal, healthy-sized Great Danes, but he already towered above them, and a regular-sized Great Dane is not exactly a small dog. He was a friendly soul, though, to the extent that for some months he had an open sore on his tail that refused to heal, no matter what anybody tried. The problem wasn't anything medical, the vets eventually decided, he was just so happy and so large that as he wandered around wagging his tail at everything in sight, the tip kept bashing into things which su with such regularity that it wore away the skin and then would be kept open by further impacts. This was solved by two factors. Firstly, he was sold to one Benjamin Cheney, who had a much more open environment for him to live in, and the vet also applied some healing cream and a bandage to the tip of the tail to give it some time to heal in the interim. This brought the dog to the suburb of Mowbray, whereupon the new arrival's intelligence was quickly demonstrated. Mr Cheney had a refrigerator, which, being an old-school model, opened via the use of a lever. With a leg of cooked mutton keeping in there, he took a slice, made himself a sandwich, and offered his new pet a portion of the meat, and then went to sleep. The next morning, he returned to the kitchen to find a fridge that was suspiciously lacking in any mutton, one sleepy Great Dane, and one very clean leg bone on the kitchen floor. Fortunately, this intelligence extended to the dog already being house-trained and able to both ask for water and to be let out to perform his bodily functions, which he did by first excavating a hole, performing the functions, and then burying it again. His name was still undecided, but less than a month later, Mr Cheney was placed in charge of the United Services Institute in Simonstown, just to the south of Cape Town in South Africa. Technically speaking, as the name suggested, this was open to all branches of the armed services, but since the British Army hadn't had a significant presence in South Africa since the last Boer War, 
and there weren't that many aircraft in southern Africa generally in 1938, let alone warplanes, the RAF was thin on the ground as well. However, there was a fairly important dockyard and associated naval base guarding this vital commercial sea route, and so there were plenty of Royal Navy sailors around, plus semi-regular visits from various other nations' vessels. Reasoning that his new companion would make an excellent guard dog, and perhaps more importantly would spend the day eating scraps at the king's expense rather than his own, Mr Cheney brought him with him each day to work. Mowbray being pretty much central west Cape Town, and the urbanisation having yet to connect the main city and Simonstown together, the Great Dane soon got used to the commuting route. At his day job, he apparently took a lighting to the general population of ratings in their square rig, but was merely tolerant of those in the tighter fore and aft rig, possibly because the baggier trousers of the square rig were more interesting to chew upon, or possibly because most of the common sailors were the ones who were much more likely to bring him snacks. But it was also quickly evident that the new arrival was tolerant of humans, but was in no way mastered by them. Although he never bit anyone, if a sailor tried to make him go somewhere he didn't want to, there would be a baring of teeth and a deep rumbling growl that was likened to a large barrel being rolled over the deck of a ship, only significantly angrier. Remarkably for a bunch of sailors, nobody ever decided to push him to see exactly what would happen. That he probably outweighed a good number of them was likely an influencing factor. He also proved very capable of breaking up fights, either rearing up and pushing the sailors apart with his front paws, or just running headlong into them and knocking them over. Further growls would then make it clear that he did not find their behaviour acceptable. By this stage, it was late 1938, and he'd now reached full size. Measured at one metre tall, or two metres if he stood up on his back legs, and weighing in at about 67 kilos or 150 pounds of pure muscle, he also had found a friend. Mr Cheney had acquired a somewhat smaller bulldog named Ajax, which the Great Dane decided was some kind of slightly simple-minded but otherwise lovable mascot. Although he would also be seen at his angriest if other dogs bothered this new friend. His sheer size, combined with a howl of rage and a full-body charge, saw pretty much any other dog in the area, much like the sailors, decide that discretion was the better part of valour in all cases, and rapidly they left Ajax well alone. There was a hierarchy involved to this. However, even little Ajax was not allowed in the Institute. It was made clear to all canine companions that this building was a one-dog domain. Towards the close of 1938, the Leander-class HMS Neptune, which had large numbers of sailors from both New Zealand and South Africa aboard, called in for a posting in the South Atlantic. It would be this arrival that would grace the dog with his name. One of the gangplanks of the ship happened to be angled in such a way that it caught the sun for much of the day. This naturally became the favoured sun lounging space of the dog. The men of the ship rapidly learned that he would not be moved, nor did he appreciate his sunlight being blocked by someone standing around for too long. Whilst generally beloved of the sailors, as long as he maintained this position, he was also subjected to the full range of a sailor's extensive vocabulary, which was usually prefaced or ended with some variation on the phrase, you bloody nuisance. Thus, we may now refer to the noble hound, Nuisance, who now decided to extend his imperium to include all docked ships. This led to mixed results when he came into contact with various ship's mascots, many of whom were dogs. Some, such as HMS Milford's Dachshund, were treated with a tolerant disdain, Others, such as HMS Londonderry's Bulldog, were permitted to exist aboard their own ship, or out of sight if they were ashore, but they would be pursued with vigour if they were otherwise sighted wandering around the base. However, during his life, Nuisance was never seen to initiate an attack on any other dog. Albeit during his career, a number of dogs who were foolish enough to attack him first would come to a series of rapid and rather spectacular ends. Although dressed in the less favoured fore and aft rig, a chief petty officer from Neptune became a favoured friend as long as the ship was in station there, on the grounds that he would take nuisance into Cape Town by train and feed him large amounts of beef and lamb. 
the chief petty officer being a steward, and thus finding the way to the dog's heart was via his stomach, he also managed to dispose of significant amounts of unused ship supplies, or those that had been found unfit for human consumption at the same time as making a friend. Or at least that's what the ship's books said if anyone cared to investigate why the ship was a little bit short on corned beef and lamb chops. Having discovered the joys of train travel, nuisance now started following parties of sailors on shore leave, onto the train, and into Cape Town. However, unlike the chief petty officer, these sailors did not buy him a ticket, and this started a prolonged vendetta with the officers of the Southern African Railway Network. He was far too large to hide under a seat, and so when he was inevitably caught by a ticket inspector, he would be thrown out of the train which in and of itself was a two- or three-man job, once it arrived at the next station. Sometimes sailors would conspire to open another door in the carriage or maybe a window, which he was more than capable of jumping back in through. If, however, this didn't work out, nuisance would just wait for the next train, or if the line between the stations in question was slow or particularly windy, he'd just set off across the terrain directly and beat the train that he'd just been kicked out of to the next station and reboard there. Eventually, fed up of these antics, the railway company told Mr Cheney that if he didn't stop his dog from doing this, they would have to destroy him. This put Mr Cheney in a difficult position. He couldn't let poor Nuisance be killed, but he also knew there was no chance he could guarantee that Nuisance wouldn't board more trains in the future. And so, with a heavy heart, he decided Nuisance would have to be sold to someone who presumably lived well away from the railway, or maybe to a ship that found itself in need of a new mascot. News of this predicament, and what had caused it, quickly got out, and soon almost every rating petty officer, and not a few fully commissioned officers, were up in arms. The commander-in-chief of the Royal Navy's South Atlantic station got involved, but the railway company remained completely intractable. If the dog did not have a ticket, next time he was found aboard their trains, he'd be taken out and shot. Nuisance's brother, Bats, was on the ration list at the nearby Royal Navy Hospital, serving as a guard dog. And this seems to have been a source of inspiration for the Commander-in-Chief South Atlantic, who at this time was Vice Admiral Sir George Leon, a veteran of the Battle of Jutland. He decreed that Nuisance had, in fact, volunteered for service in the Royal Navy. He was thus issued with a temporary rail pass and could not be removed from the train nor interfered with any more than could any other sailor in the Navy. Sensing that he had gained an invulnerability save against rail personnel, Nuisance would occasionally bring little Ajax along with him, although the tiny bulldog often needed to either be picked up by his big brother's jaws to board the train, or, when Nuisance was feeling somewhat less charitable, simply catapulted aboard with the use of his snout. A rail inspector did try to invict the passless Ajax, who was snuggled up next to Nuisance on one occasion. Uh, Neither he nor any of his colleagues would repeat that attempt, although Nuisance was gently persuaded not to eat the unfortunate man by a nearby sailor. By June, it was time for Nuisance to have his fitness evaluation so he could get his official papers, which did pose a number of issues as the form was obviously designed for humans. Some of the trickier issues were left blank to be decided at a later date, but eventually his papers would come through, officially marking the start of his service as August 25th, 1939. Faced with the problem of the forms demanding both a first and a last name, and the latter box being filled with nuisance, some enterprising officer in the department filled in the former box with just, and hence able seaman just nuisance was born. His listed occupation was Bone Crusher, and his religious denomination was Scrounger, a faith that he was clearly utterly devoted to. Possibly on account of his bark being a very efficient method of letting the entire base know that something had displeased him, he was enlisted into the Signals branch. His rank came about from a moment's thought by a commanding officer, which was recorded as follows. It wouldn't be fair to rate him as an ordinary seaman, the lowest rank in his branch. Nuisance had really been an unofficial rating for about 18 months now, and all things being equal, if he'd been human, he would have received a promotion to able seaman. Obviously, there would be no point in making him a leading seaman, and he hasn't got the necessary length of service to be rated as a petty officer. So, able seaman it is. On the second page of his form was his signature, courtesy of a paw placed on an inkpad and then on the paper. 
A strong ID tag was made and attached to his collar, along with a disc indicating that he now officially had a free rail pass, the same as all other Royal Navy personnel were entitled to. And along with his new rank came a ratings hat and cap tally. This meant the Royal Navy was now in charge of nuisance, and so Mr Cheney, although legally technically still his owner, saw him off with a great feast of beef, custard and milk. Sensing a change of location, nuisance allowed Ajax into the United Services Institute for the first time, and the next day he reported for duty and was moved by truck to Froggy Pond Barracks, where the commanding officer of the barracks read the accompanying letter that had been sent with the dog and then said to his chief petty officer, It seems the commanding officer of Afrikanda, which was the main central Royal Navy HQ in the area, has requested certain privileges for able seaman nuisance, which of course will be granted. Commander Shakespeare has always been known for his sense of humour, and requests that this rating be assigned in charge of all dog watches. Secondly, regarding his victualling, he is to feed at the same time as all ratings stationed here, but is to be allotted only milk for drink, and meat or bones as his food. No salads, vegetables, nor any fruit, which he refused to eat. See, I knew I liked him. His place of eating will be in the cookhouse of the dining hall, and once a day, at dinner time preferably, he is to be given a large helping of spotted dick, this apparently being the only sweet that he likes. Able seaman nuisance will be billeted in number one hut, with sheet, blankets, pillows, and mattress provided for his bunk. He is to be given shore leave each night, and allowed all night leave. At weekends, he has permission to go ashore from noon Saturday and Sunday till 7.30am the following days. The senior rating in charge of Hut 1 is to report any breaches of discipline inside that billet by this new rating. Will you see to that please, Chief? Many of the sailors now billeted there remembered Nuisance from the main base, and were thrilled at his presence. They already knew, for example, that Nuisance kept himself very clean, he hated baths, but loved showers, he always showed up for parades, and he even stood still at attention for colours and the national anthem. Here, Nuisance enjoyed himself, quickly learnt the train route to Cape Town, and generally was having great fun, except for one incident when a very large and very drunk sailor took his bunk by mistake. Nuisance did try to encourage the man to return to his bunk by removing the blanket a couple of times, but this only succeeded in waking the man, who lashed out in a drunken stupor. This turned out to be a mistake, for within moments Nuisance had reared up and put the man down on the ground with a strong shove. Several other ratings managed to persuade Nuisance back into the now vacated bunk instead of being the proximate cause of the rapid end of someone's naval career. At one stage it was reported that Nuisance had been run over by a car in Cape Town and had been taken to the minesweeping base there in critical condition. This news spread rapidly throughout the Cape area and a vet and Mr Cheney sped to the base, only to find the dog in question had died. But the dog was not nuisance. It was a smaller Great Dane, albeit one with very similar markings. But this news was generally not known. A few hours later, so distressed was a large portion of the South African contingent of the Royal Navy at the possible passing of nuisance, that news of the mistaken identity had to be broadcast over several bases' tannoy systems, to a general rejoicing that apparently would not be seen again until the end of the war itself was announced. Nuisance, however, reappeared at a base a few hours later to a bewildering array of hugs, food and lager, probably wondering what all the fuss was about, before retiring to bed. Orders were then issued that at least one rating must always accompany Nuisance on his shore leave to ensure his safety and prevent another collapse in morale. It was now early 1941, and the number of ships passing through was increasing dramatically, with the Mediterranean now closed to through traffic, the usual trade, plus many of the supplies that were headed for Admiral Cunningham's Mediterranean fleet, were having to take the long route via South Africa. It was at this point that Nuisance got himself into a spot of bother. Having acquired a taste for lager and beer after his apparent death and miracul miraculous resurrection, he was 45 minutes late in getting back to base and had to be placed on caution, as he'd also returned completely blotted. Shortly thereafter, Nuisance was transferred, much to the grief of his messmates. But this was not a punishment. He was being sent back to the central base, HMS Africanda, as a series of morale-boosting speeches and events were planned for the local populace, and many civilians had requested the presence of the famous dog. 
In these endeavours, it turned out Nuisance had a few more tricks in his repertoire, including the ability to dance, when he felt like it, with front paws on the shoulders of his chosen partner. But for the most part, he contented himself with enjoying shore leave with the other sailors, in part because the standard hotel, not far from the train station, always gave him a free quart of beer, and as any good sailor knows, one does not pass up a chance for a free drink. This worked well for both parties, as news of the canine arrival drew in many sailors, which would more than compensate the owner in the form of many more opened bar tabs. Then, after a few more drinks and some time loftily monitoring the local population, he would head for the Cape Town dockyard to inspect any new arrivals. This dockyard mostly handled merchant ships and the smaller combatants like sloops, whereas the bigger warships would be over back at Simonstown. In these inspections, he would generally pursue whichever ship's mascots he came across in order to assert his dominance, but the average ship's mascots not only knew their ship better than the visiting Great Dane, but they were universally also considerably smaller, and thus capable of sequestering themselves in places that nuisance could not reach. At some point in 1941, the Admiralty in London were contacted, and a bemused desk officer granted permission for able seaman nuisance to be excused wearing his cap whilst on duty, except on formal occasions and on parades, as some of his fellow sailors had noticed that whilst he didn't mind having it on, he tended to find relief when it was removed at night. He was also, around this time, the victim of a friendly kidnapping attempt, when a British heavy cruiser, which will remain nameless, stopped by in Cape Town, instead of Simonstown, and on their last night the sailors contrived to persuade Nuisance to join them aboard their ship, which then duly sailed. But when it was three miles out of port, the dog noticed his home vanishing into the mist, and promptly hurled himself over the stern and started swimming for shore. Despite the vicious currents that exist in this area of the world, such was his strength that he managed to swim back to shore, although only barely, and had to spend the next two days in an isolation ward recovering from the experience. He wasn't the only one, as the population of the various bases in the Cape area made it widely known that should this particular heavy cruiser find its way back to Cape Town or Simonstown, the crew would be best placed to stay aboard their ship for the duration of their stay. In mid-1942, there were two incidents that stood out. Firstly, poor nuisance was knocked over by a car, but he did manage to make his way home. At the time, the only injuries anyone could discern were bad bruising around his shoulders, and for this he was ordered to take several days' rest. The other incident was the arrival of the rather battered US light cruiser USS Marblehead. This being an American vessel, it was a little different to the usual fare of British and Commonwealth ships, and so Nuisance was quick to ensure that he had conducted a full inspection of the ship, even as repair work went on around him. It turned out that, although unfamiliar with him as compared to their British counterparts, almost all of whom, at all postings around the world, had by this point heard of the dog, American sailors were still fairly fast in working out that Nuisance pretty much did as he wanted, and that interfering with his inspections was a very bad idea. He was, however, banned from attending further social parties ashore when, at one of them, another guest's Pekingese dog decided it would be a good idea to nip at his ankles. This led to a chase through the entertainment tent, which left the smaller dog hiding under a crate of beer and the rather larger nuisance having upset practically every single table of food and drink in the area, as well as a few party guests, in his relentless pursuit of his tiny erstwhile attacker. However, he rapidly proved his worth when, soon thereafter, he was found at the fleet air arm base at Wingfield. He was loudly barking at the entrance of a small toilet cubicle right on the edge of the sentry parameter. As this was not normal behaviour for nuisance, and as his barks were loud enough that pretty much the entire base could hear him, other sailors rapidly came to investigate, and then they found nuisance was guarding a rating who had arrived in South Africa a few days ago, and as it turned out, had malaria contracted at the previous posting, and passed out in this cubicle. Without the actions of the loyal dog, the sailor in question would almost certainly have passed away a few hours later from exposure or dehydration before anyone found him. 1943 rolled around, and Nuisance divided his time between the dockyard and the airbase, for he seemed to like watching aircraft take off, although apparently he showed no interest in monitoring their landings. 
This did not go unobserved by the aircrew, and a bunch of them conspired to take Nuisance aloft as an observer in an albacore that was to perform one of its daily sweeps of the oceans looking for U-boats or armed merchant raiders. This proved to be an activity that Nuisance absolutely loved, and the men of the Royal Navy played along with it. Technically speaking, the pilot would be in a fantastic amount of trouble if it was discovered that he'd taken a dog up in a, in a fleet air arm aircraft for an operational flight. But not only did the base's aircrew conspire to ensure that Nuisance made it on and off the plane officially undetected, but a destroyer that was escorting the convoy that the aircraft had flown over spotted the unusual passenger, but rapidly decided to turn a Nelson-style blind eye to the aerial proceedings. Shortly thereafter, though, Nuisance tore a muscle jumping out of a moving truck, but was rapidly rushed to hospital and given all possible care, and with a prescription for therapeutic swims at Wingfield Swimming Pool, he was back on his feet in a couple of weeks. He would then go on to enjoy a number of further excursions in various albacores and actually proved to be quite a valuable asset. Although no U-boats were spotted during these flights, indeed U-boats were actually fairly rare around South Africa, he did prove to be remarkably capable at spotting pretty much any object disturbing the surface of the sea, whether that be dolphins, ships, or whales. So if there had been any subs in the area, he almost certainly would have noticed them long before the human crew did. He also proved to be quite adept at detecting, and then dismembering, large scorpions which prowled the base and had already sent several men to hospital. An attempt to deal with the occasional hornets that also flew around the base was somewhat less successful though, as his chosen method of dealing with them, leaping off the ground and then catching them in his jaws, only ended up getting him stung. Snakes, on the other hand, including Cape Cobras, were dispatched in a similar manner to the scorpions. But towards the end of 1943, Nuisance was diagnosed with stress and exhaustion, and was sent to kennels for several weeks to rest and recover. However, his extremely active lifestyle and a host of battle scars acquired over the years were beginning to catch up with him. After being released from the kennels, he injured himself twice more, jumping out of moving vehicles, something he hadn't had much issue with until recently, and it seemed that that car accident a few years earlier had also had longer-term effects. He was rapidly becoming paralysed in his hindquarters, and his general health began to fail fast in March 1944. It was clear that no recovery was possible, and so he had to be put to sleep on April 1st, 1944, age 7. The next day, he was buried with full military honours at the Clava camp near Simonstown, in a ceremony that was attended by well over 100 officers and men. Hardened veterans who had multiple awards for gallantry in the face of the enemy were seen to be crying openly as the last post was sounded. He was survived by two puppies that he had sired a couple of years earlier, starting a line of Great Danes that seems to have continued for quite some time, perhaps a line that maybe even persists to this day. As well as a still very well-preserved grave, he can of course be visited at the statue we mentioned at the beginning of this video, which has pride of place on the Simonstown waterfront. If you'd like to know more about the many adventures of Just Nuisance, then I strongly recommend the book Just Nuisance AB, his full story by Terence Sisson, which was published back in 1985 and was written, obviously, by Terence Sisson, who actually served alongside Nuisance for just over a year back in the Second World War.